Theodore Roosevelt, soldier, president, statesman, American. In 1895, Roosevelt became police commissioner of New York City, declared war on corrupt politicians. Offices are not the property of politicians. They belong to the people. I have no honorable alternative save to enforce the laws, and I will enforce them. Let every man turn against me. Every editor, every office holder, every politician. But as long as I am head of this police board, I will not rest until I have wiped out the last vestige of graft and corruption in the city of New York. Brave words, Mr. Roosevelt, but I'm afraid the senator won't like them. No, Rafferty, but the people will. I wouldn't be relying too much on the people if I were you. Or on your police force, either. They know which side their bread's buttered on. You better not be so hard-headed. Learn to take orders. I'm not here to take orders, but to give them. Then you won't be here long. Long enough to make life miserable for political bosses. Did you ever hear of the big stick, Rafferty? No, can't say that I have. You will, and feel it. Now, good day, gentlemen. Looks like rough days ahead for our police commission, Teddy. I know, Andrews. The bosses don't like me. The longer I live, the greater cause I shall give them for disliking me. Soon I shall be assailing some of the ablest, shrewdest men in this city who will be fighting for their lives. But first, I'll clean up this police department. And if I can't get cooperation, I'll do it myself. And Teddy did do it himself. Fearlessly, relentlessly, he fought the evil system that fed on bribery and law-breaking. Quick to punish grafters, he was equally quick to reward honest men. For two years, he wielded the big stick of civic reform. Nor could any faction sway him from his resolve to clean up New York. Mr. Roosevelt, you can't condemn our tenements. If you do, we'll lose thousands. There's better play ball to the party. The senator's getting tired of this nonsense. One moment, gentlemen. I would rather have this administration fail because it enforced the laws than see it succeed by violating them. Nonsense. Will you or will you not stop working against us? If improving the living conditions of the poor means working against you, I've only just begun. You don't know what you're doing. You'll be ruined politically. For the last time, will you listen to reason? Good evening, gentlemen. Well, you've done it this time. Those men own a good third of New York City. And they should be the first to uphold the municipal laws. You mean the Roosevelt laws, don't you? You're touching a corpse, Andrews. Politically, I'm as dead as Jonah. A message from Washington, sir. Come, Andrews. President McKinley's appointed me Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Splendid. In Washington, Citadel of American Democracy, Roosevelt plunged vigorously into his new duties. It's the American system that needs reforming. We're too trusting, too easygoing. We must have a Navy that is strong enough not only to sustain the honor of our flag, but to uphold the Monroe Doctrine and discourage all thought of foreign aggression. You mean that... Uh, I mean that today it's Cuba and possibly war with Spain. Tomorrow, who knows? Mr. Secretary, President McKinley will see you now in the cabinet room. So the cabinet is to enjoy another laugh. Well, let them. When we're at war, they'll have cause to remember my advice. You really think we'll have to fight? I'm sure of it. You wait here, William. There may be further news from Havana. <laughs> Mr. President. Mr. Roosevelt. Sorry to interrupt, gentlemen, but the situation is most serious. You have something new to tell us, Mr. Roosevelt? Sir, I beg of you to act while there's still hope for peace. Inform Spain that the United States will consider it an act of war if she sends a fleet across the Atlantic. I'm afraid you've been having bad dreams again, Roosevelt. You'll have worse ones if you don't remedy the condition of your army. Hold your horses, Teddy. I'm Secretary of War, you know. Mr. Roosevelt, will you explain why you think the peace of the United States is in danger? Because only that nation is prepared for peace that knows how to fight. Speak softly, but carry a big stick. I appreciate your patriotic attitude, but I fail to see that any emergency yet warrants... Mr. President, terrible news, gentlemen. The battleship Maine has been sunk in Havana Harbor with great loss of life. Gentlemen, I'm afraid it is true. Mr. Roosevelt, we owe you our deepest apologies. What do you advise we do now? That I cable Admiral Dewey in Hong Kong to call his ships for immediate action. By all means. From now on, gentlemen, it's remember the main. 
Remember the Maine. Everywhere outraged Americans took up the battle cry. War was soon declared and thousands answered the call to the color. In Washington, Roosevelt and Captain Leonard Wood made plans to raise a regiment of their own. It's a just war, Leonard, because it threatens our Western Hemisphere. Now that it's come, I can't ask others to do the fighting while I stay at home. We'll have the finest outfit of them all. Volunteers from every part of the country, every walk of life. Those Western bad men friends of yours may give us some trouble. They'll give more to the enemy. I don't doubt it. When do we start recruiting? At once. I'm setting up temporary headquarters here. We'll enlist half the men from the east and train the entire regiment in San Antonio, Texas. We need a name for them. Something different. Rough Riders. Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Rough Riders? That's bully. Please. All right, you men. Gather around. I have something to say. Come on, men. Gather around. Bring it up. You men have reached the final point. Thousands are anxious to join this regiment. And if any one of you doesn't mean business, let him say so now. Good. Leave it once for Texas. You men study these drill manuals on the way. Get busy now, all of you. Gangway! Gangway! Where's that foreman, Teddy Roosevelt? Jim Rollins! <laughs> How did they ever let you out of the Dakota Badlands? Don't tell me you putted any more sheriffs. Oh, I reckon they got kind of darn chasing. <laughs> Folks say you're getting ready to fight a war, partner. You bet your life we are, Jim. Did you come to join up? Well, since you're the only galoot that ever called my hand and lived to brag about it, I figured I'd better team up with you in this here, Lucas. Bully for you. I'm delighted, Jim. Well, you lead the way, Teddy, and we'll do the rest. <laughs> And Teddy did lead the way from Washington to Texas and on to Cuba through the Battle of San Juan Hill with its immortal charge to glory. It was Teddy the Rough Rider, Teddy the Soldier, Teddy the Fighting Colonel of a Fighting Regiment. Finally, the Spanish yoke was broken. Cuba liberated. The army sent home. At Montauk Point, Long Island, the Rough Riders assembled for a last farewell to their indomitable leader. At ease! Outside of my own family, I shall always feel that stronger ties exist between you and me than between me and anyone else on earth. I'm proud of you men, inordinately proud of you. If what you have done is made known to the youth of our country, it will be a stirring example for them to follow. And now I should like to shake every man's hand in gratitude and farewell. Hooray! I'll never forget Hooray! you. Take care of yourself, Tom. Goodbye, Jack. Oh. Welcome home, Colonel. The party has missed you. I'd say that is most unusual, Senator. Almost as unusual as your visit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may as well be frank, I see. Yes, yes, of course. Roosevelt, you're a national hero. We are not any too popular in New York right now, and with election coming up, well... Uh, you've no business expecting me to take command of a ship just because that ship is sinking. A man always has two reasons for what he does, a good one and the real one. Now, what is the real one? The party needs you. And you'll be elected governor hands down. I'd rather have commanded this regiment than be governor of New York three times over. Although I don't think I'd be elected, I'll accept your offer. Splendid. You'll never regret it. And of course, you'll always consult us on policy. Always. And then I'll do exactly what I think is right. Elected governor of New York, Roosevelt did what he thought was right. Refused to compromise with those bent on exploiting the people. In a New York hotel, a group of worried men were discussing the situation they themselves had created. That man's got to be stopped. We're sick to death of him. This tax on public franchise is the last straw. I warned you, Senator. I knew the minute he got in, he'd start cooperating with the people. He's too confounded honest to be in politics. Sure as Satan, he'll be reelected. If he's nominated, my friend. Just what do you mean? I mean that we'll nominate Mr. Roosevelt for Vice President of the United States. Tie his hands for good. Magnificent. Good idea. The Vice Presidency has been a political tomb for over 60 years. <laughs> Roosevelt's no fool. He won't accept. That gentleman is where the public will do us a service. 1900, the Republican National Convention. Congratulations, sir. You're certain to be the next Vice President. They've nominated you by acclamation. Yes, so I hear. Perhaps I shouldn't have come to Philadelphia, but I did want to make that speech for President McKinley. I'm afraid the people would have forced your nomination anyway. They believe they're doing you a great honor. They are. But I feel like a man who's been sentenced to four years of solitary confinement. But I'll not take it lying down. If I've been put on a shelf, my enemies will find I can still make it very unpleasant for them. 
Somehow I can't believe there are any chains strong enough to hold Theodore or Roosevelt. Loeb's prophecy was to have a strange and tragic fulfillment. Six months after the McKinley-Roosevelt election, the beloved president was shot down by an assassin. When the doctors promised McKinley's recovery, Roosevelt, deeply thankful, left for a needed rest in the Adirondack Mountains. This is a good place, William. We'll have our lunch here. It's a good 10 miles back to camp. Too bad the boys couldn't come along. Archie and Quentin would have enjoyed this hike. I had quite a time convincing the young rascals it was too far for them. You know, William, I don't think I've ever seen them so disappointed. <laughs> They'd rather tackle a mountain than eat. They don't realize there are other mountains ahead for all of us. Mr. Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt. They come from the station agent at Clear Creek. I brought it as soon as I could. The president's condition has changed for the worse. Come to Buffalo at once, Cortell you. I must go at once. William, go to camp. Get a buggy ready. Ask Mrs. Roosevelt to please pack my bag. Yes, sir. But, Mr. Roosevelt, sir, it'll be dark before you can get back, and it's 30 miles to the railroad. A dangerous road at night, sir. Can't be helped. I must reach Buffalo by the quickest possible means. God only knows what tragedy has befallen us there now. In Buffalo, during one of the darkest hours of our nation, McKinley's cabinet awaited a new man of destiny. Mr. Vice President. Mr. Secretary. Gentlemen. As you already know, the government has been without a constitutional head for 13 and a half hours. For reasons of state, it is the wish of the cabinet that there be no further delay. I shall take the oath at once. Judge Hazel will administer it. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Thus, at 42, Theodore Roosevelt assumed his country's highest office. From the first, he was a president of all the people, made it plain he would not favor any one faction. I am here to safeguard the interests of the American people. This government is not and shall never be controlled by the so-called privileged classes. But your administration is under obligations to us. My administration is obligated to no one but the people themselves. I shall treat every man on his merits as a man. The doors to the White House will swing open just as easily for the poor as for the rich. The labor unions and corporations will have a square deal. But most important, the private citizen will have a square deal. I will not submit the dictation of any sort. In 1902, when the Pennsylvania coal strike threatened national economic disaster, Roosevelt intervened in no uncertain manner. As you all know, this Pennsylvania coal strike has created a national emergency. That's why I've summoned you mine owners and labor leaders. You have got to settle your differences at once. All we're asking is a fair agreement. Well, gentlemen, how about arbitration? There's nothing to arbitrate. We said everything we got to say. The trouble is, you mine owners think you own the men. And you miners think you own the mines. You're both wrong. I think we let the American people decide this issue. They'll stand just so much of this sort of thing and not one bit more. Uh, wait, Mr. President. Uh, naturally, we'd be willing to uh, discuss the situation. Of course, we don't want to be stubborn. A very wise decision, my friends. Very wise indeed. Congratulations to you both. By such fearless square dealing did Theodore Roosevelt endear himself to his countrymen. In 1904, their votes returned him to the presidency by a record plurality. The press, sir. At your service, gentlemen. Mr. President, what are your most important reasons for building the Panama Canal? Economy and defense. In an emergency, our Navy can be moved quickly from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. The Panama Canal will be America's lifeline and must always be adequately defended as such. Mr. President, would you care to tell us how you managed to put through the pure food laws in such amazingly fast time? The big stick, backed by public opinion, is a powerful weapon, my friends. <laughs> well, one thing more, Mr. President. May we print the news you are to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for your efforts in stopping the Russo-Japanese War? Yes, if you'll also print the reasons for those efforts. Gentlemen, any war anywhere is bound to affect the welfare of every American citizen. This fact will become more apparent in future years. It is therefore our solemn duty to prevent war with every possible peaceful means at our command. In 1909, Roosevelt gave way to William Howard Taft, began his years of extensive travel. Then came 1914 and the war that shook the world. Not allowed to go himself, Roosevelt gave four sons to America, the youngest of whom was to die in Europe. It was a blow from which the old rough writer never recovered. 
at Sagamore Hill in the last winter of his life. Have one moment, please. It's the press, sir. They'd like a statement from you about the boy. Thank you. Yes, this is Colonel Roosevelt. Quentin's mother and I are glad that he got to the front and had an opportunity to be of some service to his country, to show the stuff there was in him before his fate befell him. are fit to live who do not fear to die. None is fit to die who is shrunk from the joy of life and the duty of life. Both life and death are part of the same great adventure. Don't you think it's a little late to write your speech tonight, sir? It's never late when there's work to be done. But the doctor won't approve. No, but the American people will. Young man, take this down. There can be no compromise in the fight for Americanism. I am confident that our people will work hand in hand with any public man who in good faith does all that is possible to see that the United States so conducts herself as a nation as to conserve the honor, the institutions, and the peaceful welfare of our own citizens. Our next business will be to help guarantee the peace of justice for the world at large. There cannot be, there must not be a repetition of the crime against Belgium. I am anti-brutality. I should protest as strongly against wrongdoing by any foreign power. The little nations of the earth have a right to live. And if civilization is to endure, the great nations must respect that right. Let us unite in the one great endeavor of achieving an enduring peace with all the world. But let us not forget that the surest promise of that peace lies in our constant preparedness to meet all eventualities from without and to combat and destroy all subversive elements working from within. There can be no divided allegiance here. Any man who says that he is an American and seeks to promote foreignisms within our borders is not a true American. We have room for but one flag, the American flag. We have room for but one language, the language of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. And we have room for but one loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people.